Fluid and electrolytes. This concept is a big one. Our bodies are made of 60% water and the electrolytes in our bodies regulate so many functions, nerve and muscle functions, provide hydration for the body, regulate our acidity and pressure, and even help rebuild damaged tissue. So settle in because we've got a lot to learn in the concept of fluid and electrolytes. Now for this part one of our fluid and electrolytes um, chat, we're gonna be in Giddens chapter eight and Davis chapter 38. And you'll be completing your concept study guide version B. So you'll be studying along with me, looking in your text, writing things down, taking notes as we go. And here are the rest of the things that we're gonna to accomplish together. We're gonna to really have a good understanding and describe and define this concept of a fluid and electrolyte balance talk about risk factors for impairment, recognize when things are out of balance, and then talk about what do we do as nurses um, as interventions to promote fluid and electrolyte balance. So let's go ahead and start by defining and chatting about this concept of fluid and electrolyte balance. So as I said in our introduction, our body is made out of about 60% water. And we have this water both in the cells and out of the cells. And we also have electrolytes in our cells and out of our cells. And fluid and electrolyte balance is discussing the process that regulates that extracellular fluid volume. So fluid outside of the cells, the body fluid osmolality, meaning the concentration of that fluid, as well as the concentrations of electrolytes in the bloodstream. Now, in terms of scope, we can talk about that being a balance or an imbalance, and we can have too little or too much of a fluid or an electrolyte. And in order to maintain optimal balance, um, your output must be matched with the input. So whatever goes out must come back in to maintain a good balance in a fluid or in an electrolyte. And so when we're talking about the scope of fluid and electrolyte balance, we're really talking about that fluid and electrolytes can be perfectly balanced or we can have too much or too little of either a fluid or an electrolyte. So let's talk about water regulation in our body. Most of our uh, intake of water is gonna come through our mouth and be absorbed by the body in through the GI tract, specifically through the intestines mostly. And then that uh, water is then distributed into the interstitial space. That means like inside the tissue itself. And then the other point that the water goes to is in the vascular space into the ve veins and the arteries and the capillaries of our body. And really water is that primary body fluid that has so many functions in terms of transport and elimination um, in our bodies. And water content varies with age and gender and adipose tissue, adipose meaning the fatty tissue of the body. Water contains solutes. So it contains electrolytes like sodium, chloride, magnesium, potassium, all of these charged particles that our body needs and regulates many different body functions. And then water also contains non-electrolytes as well. So where does all this body fluid go? Well, it goes into the cells and it goes out of the cells. And so in intracellular literally means within the cells themselves and extracellular fluid means fluid outside of the cells. And so you can talk about the interstitial. Um, it's going to go in between the cells, the lymph, the GI fluid, the spinal column fluid. It's into the tissues itself. Um, and then you can talk about the intravascular. So inside the vascular system, like the veins and the arteries, then a tiny amount of fluid goes into this transcellular space. So the space in between cells, typically like the epithelial cells of the body. So it just kind of hangs out in between and fills in those open spaces. Now, how do fluids and electrolytes move um, across in the body, across tissues and out of cells? Well, there's four different kind of main ideas here, and they're talked about in your Davis book. And three of them have to do with moving from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration, and one has to do with something else. So osmosis, diffusion, and filtration all involved fluids or electrolytes shifting from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. 
And in our bodies, sodium is really the primary driver of where how fluids shift. And that's because sodium and water are best friends. They love each other so much. We're, and it's like a little puppy. So wherever sodium goes, water just follows no matter what. So you have really high levels of sodium in your body. You're going to have high levels of water. Think about after you've eaten a really salty meal and how you can kind of see your fingers swelling up. Yeah, that's because there's more sodium. So you've got more water. Now, active transport is the one of these um, movement ideas that's different. It, does, it actually goes against the current, kind of like those salmon swimming upstream in Alaska. Um, and it's actively transporting either fluids or electrolyte particles from an area of, high, of uh, lower concentration to an area of higher concentration. So it goes against the flow. And the most common example of that would be the movement of ATP into cells that need energy. And so it's those, remember those little boom pows from the Krebs cycle, remember that from A&P class? It moves from an area that, to an area that needs extra energy in the cells. Now remember when we're talking about fluid or electrolyte balance, whatever goes in needs to come out and it needs to be about the same amount in order for us to maintain that fluid or electrolyte balance. So what do we intake throughout our day? Well, we primarily intake through our food and through fluids. Um, and, and that is regulated by our hypothalamus telling us that we're hungry or that we're thirsty. And so we, we gain water mostly through food or drink. And then we take out water, we lose water insensibly through our skin as we sweat or through our lungs as we breathe. Remember in the winter when you can like breathe out and see a puff of smoke coming out of your mouth? Well, you're losing water when you're doing that. You also lose water and fluids through your urine and through your feces. And approximately you're urinating or voiding about 1500 mLs per day. So again, through the feces, the exhalation, perspiration, and urine, we lose water. So we have to gain water every day because we lose water every day. Well, I don't know about you, but sometimes hormonal teenagers can be a little bossy and demanding. Well, the good news is in our bodies, we also have hormonal teenagers and they're bossy and demanding, but in a good way. They keep our bodies in check and tell us what to do in terms of managing our fluid and electrolyte status. So ADH is that first horm horm hormone that you're seeing on this slide. So antidiuretic hormone tells your kidneys how much water to excrete and how much water to reabsorb by the kidneys and keep in the bloodstream. And so when you are very dehydrated, uh, your antidiuretic hormone is gonna go way down and it's gonna be really quiet because it's not gonna want you to keep excreting a lot. And if you're really, really um, overly fluid volume overload, the antidiuretic hormone is gonna be screaming saying, get rid of that stuff. We don't need all that water in here. And ADH works great on water, but it, it is not bossy enough to boss around sodium. So it tells your body to lose water, but not necessarily lose sodium. The renin angiotensin system, on the other hand, is bossy enough to not only tell water what to do in your, in your kidneys, but also to boss around the sodium. And so if you need to lose more water, it'll also tell the, the sodium to get out of the way too and be excreted. Or if you need to maintain more water because you're dehydrated, it will both maintain the water and the sodium. And this aldosterone itself is regulated by something in your body called the renin angiotensin system. Now you also have a thyroid hormone and BNF, which both also have an influence on how water is controlled by your body. So lots of different hormonal regulations that tell your, how, your body how much water to excrete and how much water and maybe sodium to retain. Now let's talk about the major electrolytes of our body. Now your Davis text has some really nice charts uh, in page 1020 about these major electrolytes, but sodium is an extracellular fluid. So the way I remember sodium and potassium is potassium, which, which is a K, K um, is a, the, the chemical name for potassium K. So, and sodium is Na, right? And so sodium's like, K is like, come on, let's go into the party. We're gonna go in the cell. Okay, I'm going in. Okay, I'm going in. And sodium's like, nah, I'll stay out. Na, get it? Okay, so it's nah, I'll stay out. Sodium's outside of the cell. Potassium, okay, I'm going in. They're in the cell. 
Um, and they, the sodium regulates fluid volume. Remember, sodium and water are best friends. And potassium in, helps regulate our muscle contraction. What's wrong with that? Well, our hearts are muscles, right? So we need to have good potassium levels in order to regulate the heart contraction of our body, which is a kind of important function to have. Now you all know you're supposed to drink your calcium to you know, make sure you maintain good bone health. I remember all those uh, ads from the eighties about like, you know, drink milk with all the milk mustaches, right? So calcium is about bone health. It's also about neuromuscular function as well as cardiac function. Many of these electrolytes impact the, the um, heart and it, the electrical system of the heart. And if you don't have enough uh, uh, calcium, you can have brittle bones, something called osteoporosis. Now, magnesium, chloride, phosphorus, and bicarb are also some electrolytes that you'll need. And go ahead and read this slide for yourself to kind of talk about what their uses are and why they're important. You can pause this here. Now, remember, we're running to be really middle of the road on all of our fluids and our electrolytes, and any imbalance to one extreme or another really puts the body out of whack. And so, these electrolyte imbalances have names. Hypo, remember, means low, and hyper means high. And so hyponatremia means low sodium. Hypernatremia means high sodium. Hypomagnesemia means low magnesium. Hypermagnesemia means high mag magnesium, and so on. So hypo and hyper um, of all of these different electrolytes. Now, there are a number of different scenarios that can lead our bodies to become unbalanced in either a fluid or an electrolyte. So you can have normal output, everything going out's fine, but you're not getting in enough of a fluid or an electrolyte, or for some reason it's not absorbing. Or you can have too much output and not balanced by increased intake. The output goes up, but the intake does not. Or you can have your output less or too much intake. And so again, the teeter-totter flips, or we can see decreased output, but not balanced by a decreased intake. And so any, you, again, your intake and your output of all of your electrolytes and fluids needs to be balanced. And anytime you have a teeter-totter going on, we're going to see some kind of imbalance. And so if we're talking about deficient fluid volume, um, either we, have, we don't have enough intake or we have too much output, it's going to give us something called hypovolemia. Hypo meaning low, vol volemia meaning volume, low volume. And it's going to manifest as dehydration. And we're gonna be really dry, we're dehydrated. Think about those people, you know, walking across in the desert in the movies and they're parched and they just want a drink of water. Well, we're gonna see dry skin. The mucous membranes are gonna be dry. So if you look at the inside of your mouth, it's gonna be all shiny and pink and that's normal. But uh, on a, someone who's dehydrated, it'll be tacky and dry and not moist. You're going to see non-elastic tin skin turgor. So when you do this tenting test, uh, the skin will stay tented because there's just not enough fluid in the skin area. Um, and you're going to see decreased urine output. Why? Because the ADH is telling your body, hold on to everything you got. You can't waste this. Uh, and you're going to see a decreased blood pressure because blood pressure comes from fluid volume in the vascular space, less fluid, lower pressure. So that's hypotension. You're gonna see an increased heart rate because their body's like, well, I don't have much fluid to work with. So I gotta work harder to circulate what I've got. And it's rise in temperature. And you can also see a weight loss because water weighs, it, water has a weight. And so you're gonna see a weight loss with a de decreased fluid volume. Now on the flip side, if we have too much intake and that's more than our output, um, or we have a decreased output, but we don't have decreased intake, we're gonna have hypervolemia, fluid volume excess. Now again, it's gonna be the opposite end of the spectrum. So we're gonna see an elevated blood pressure because we've got so much fluid in our vascular space, a bounding pulse that's just like popping through those vascular systems, uh, veins because we, or arteries because we've got so much fluid there. Pale, cool skin, edema, meaning swelling, ascites, meaning swelling in the abdomen, and crackles in the lungs. Again, just wet everywhere. And these imbalances in fluid volume can have dire consequences. Things like impaired perfusion, uh, body organs and systems not getting the blood flow that they need in order to get the oxygen they need. 
impaired gas exchange or oxygenation, just not enough uh, movement of fluid in order for the body to reperfuse that and get more oxygen in the blood. And impaired cerebral function, meaning you know your, our brains need a lot of oxygen and perfusion. So if we don't have a lot of blood flow because we're uh, dehydrated, we're gonna have problems there. And even impaired neuromuscular function because of the loss of electrolytes. So let's take a, a chance here and just look at some of those risk factors for who is at risk. These are bad consequences, right? We need to identify who is at risk for having impaired fluid and electrolyte balance, imbalances. So really anybody can have um, a risk for this because we do require such a, a delicate balance with our fluid and electrolytes. Um, but of, as usual, it's the very young and the very old that are usually at greatest risk because they have the least amount of reserve. Now, infants are gonna be at the greatest risk because they have a high metabolic rate. And so they don't have a lot of time to catch up. They need everything they got, they're growing so fast. They have immature kidneys that can't really just um, navigate how to de deal with different uh, shifts in fluid volume. They have a more rapid respiratory rate, so they're going to be losing more um, insensible fluids that way. And they proportionally have more body surface area for their um, body, and so they're going to lose more fluids through and heat through their skin. And then the very old are at risk because sometimes they can't really pay attention to those thirst receptors. My mom used to say that, you know, if you, if you feel thirsty, it's already, you're probably already too dehydrated. So try not to stay her thirsty. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but those thirst sensations are there for a reason. And so that thirst sensation can be blunted in the very old. The kidneys might just kind of give up listening to ADH. You know, that ADH is that hormonal teenager that's been yelling at that kidney the whole, their whole life saying, you know, keep more water in, get that water out, keep more water in, blah, blah, blah. And the kidney's finally like, I've been listening to you for 65 years and I'm done. And so it's less sensitive to respond to ADH. And then this impaired ability to conserve water in the risk population of the very old. In terms of individual risk factors, open your book, please, if you would, to page 67 of Giddens. And let's take a look at this together, box eight, three. So this box in your text talks about four main reasons why people are gonna have fluid um, and electrolyte disturbances. And the first is different conditions. And uh, most commonly you're gonna see things like illness, like fever or vomiting or diarrhea. Things like that are gonna cause us to have an imbalance in our in intake versus our output. Um, and fever also is going to help you have you lose extra fluids. Now you can also have adverse effects from medications. Some medications actually mess with that angiotensin receptive uh, system or the aldosterone, or it messes with the ADH. And if those situations, if you don't have those hormone, hormonal teenagers in the body telling the kidneys what to do, uh, it can get you in an imbalance. So things like steroids, laxatives, antacids, diuretics, and then acute medical conditions, anything where you're going to be losing massive amounts of fluids, hemorrhages, meaning big amounts of bleeding, um, head injuries so that your body's not able to regulate with, uh, with your brain about how to maintain your fluid status. And then any kind of kidney issue. Of course, if our kidneys are excreting and maintaining fluids, if they get you know, injured, they can have a hard time keeping up with things. And then certain medical conditions, and we're gonna get into these much more um, as we go through your medical surgical um, rotations, but things like diabetes and cancer, chronic alcoholism and liver disease, and then specifically heart failure is a really big one. A lot of our heart failures have a hard time managing uh, their fluid volume status, especially. And I would say specifically from my experience is um, our renal patients who are on dialysis, people who have their blood filtered uh, by artificial kidneys and um, called dialysis machines a few times a week. And if they don't have their kidneys filtered in their blood filtered and cleaned out, they can have an increase in their potassium because usually their kidneys would excrete that. And that can lead to a lot of really dangerous things since potassium regulates our heart rhythms. And so a lot of times we'll see people who are on dialysis have a real hard time specifically with potassium if they're not compliant with, um, with their hemodialysis treatments. 
So that's going to wrap it up for part one of our chat on fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Come back for part two, and we'll be talking about how do we recognize these imbalances in people and what do we do about it? So I'll see you in part two.